Hi, I'm Emily. We are at RAF Base Amberley today with three serving members from the Navy, Army and Air Force for our Science and the ADF Facebook Live Q&A. To mark International Women and Girls in Science Day today, we thought we'd bring you three women who are currently working within science and technology based roles and find out how they're helping to drive innovation in the ADF. Now, before we start, I will let you know we are in a live airfield at the RAF base and we do have some uh, aircraft scheduled to land shortly, so we may get a little bit of noise, so please bear with us. If you see us with our uh, earmuffs, that's what that's for. <laughs> so why don't we start with a quick introduction. Can you let us know who you are, where you're from, your job role in the ADF and how long you've been serving for? My name's Rebecca, I'm an AvTech at Amberley and I've been in for three years. My name's Caitlin, I'm from central New South Wales. I'm a civil engineer in the Army and I've been in for six years now. Hi, my name's Luella. I'm a weapons electrical engineering officer currently serving on HMAS Hobart. I've been in for eight years and I'm from Sydney. So what made in each of you have an interest in your particular job role? I mean, had you always had an interest in science and engineering when you were younger? I definitely loved tinkering with objects as a kid. So uh, growing up, I just get to tinker with uh, larger toys now, which is great. <laughs> I grew up on a farm, a sheep farm at home with my mum and dad. So I loved working outside and doing uh, lots of farm work uh, and hands-on stuff. I also uh, picked watermelons, it was my first job that I ever did. So uh, doing labour type work was something that I kind of enjoyed. Um, and yeah, that's why I sort of joined. You get to further that here, absolutely. Um, so I grew up as an army brat, so I um, got to get around the countryside, see a lot of different things, and um, initially I had no interest in defence. Um, I went the civvy realm, I picked up an apprenticeship um, with Queensland Health and was, was going down the medical field. Um, and it's, it's a, it was a great lifestyle, but I needed something with a bit more structure that gave me the ability to sort of uh, progress, uh, progress my career and, um, and have a bit of fun while I was doing it. What kind of skills or characteristics did you have growing up that you would look at now and see that that relates to your particular job role? Uh, so for me personally, I did lots of uh, team sports uh, and I did some individual sports like little athletics as well. Um, but those team sports, when you're in defence, every single thing that you do is part of a team. Even being an officer, you're working with a team, you're leading and managing a team. Um, so those team sports actually helped me a lot um, to work as a team in defence. Fantastic. I think definitely teamwork and always um, that desire to be part of something bigger. Um, well, I never thought I'd end up in the military. I did drama when I was in high school and um, I was really into robotics and motor sports when I was in university and I've always been a social person. Um, so being in the military allowed me to do the teamwork aspect of it and actually be quite social and be able to experience all these, um, I guess, new experiences with all these new friends that I've found. And I, for me, that's been fantastic. What about you, Beck? Um, I was a bit the same, I guess, because I spent 10 years in the city world doing um, normal day-to-day -day life. You um, had quite a few different job roles before coming I did. to the event. Um, I did cake decorating when I first left high school because I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I just fell into a bakery. Um, and then, easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then from there, I picked up the apprenticeship with Queensland Health, and um, that sort of put me on a projectory to uh, work within the medical industry, which. Um, I absolutely enjoyed, but um, it's pretty hard. It's hard on, on you know, uh, your life and, and having a family. Um, so then I looked for a job that would give me structure, that would give me adventure, and that would give me the ability to uh, have a family, have a life, and have an awesome career at the same time. So looking at electronics engineer, um, Luella, what method of entry did you join and can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I went through the um, Defence University sponsorship, which was actually great. I did apply later on in my university because, like I said, I wasn't sure. Um, but halfway through my university degree, I applied to um, join the Defence as um, a weapons electrical engineering officer, which you can do as any engineering officer, right? And um, they basically paid for my whole um, university degree from then on. So I was lucky that I was able to graduate without a hex or help debt. And that was such a huge help for me starting my career. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So we do have a little bit of noise in the background but I think you can still hear us which is wonderful. Uh, can you talk uh, us through what your typical day looks like within your job roles? Um, tell us the kind of tech you get to work with. 
Um, so I work on the Super Hornets. This one's yours? Yes, here at Amberley. <laughs> um, so we work on a six week rotational shift. So um, one day I might be doing flight line, which is um, servicing these jets so they can fly, um, launching them, recovering them, um, and putting them to bed at the end of the night. Um, and then other days, I might be on maintenance, um, so when they come back from flying, they might have come back with little gremlins um, and we are there to problem solve what it is sure. and uh, get them back in the air. Um, and then other times we might do it, be doing nighttime maintenance. So it's a bit diverse. And it's your super hornets that are flying above us tonight. Yeah, we are making some noise. <laughs> Uh, for me, so I'm the plant troop commander at the 6th Engineer Support Regiment. So um, my job, I pretty much look after a lot of different plant equipment. I've got between 120 and 130 pieces of equipment uh, that I manage. Um, and I get the, uh, the team that I lead uh, to use that equipment and build things like drainage, uh, roads, uh, as well as I get to design a lot of things as well. So typically for me, I guess the day uh, when I'm uh, in barracks is starting at 7.30. We do PT every day um, and then from there I work either in the office or out supervising uh, on sites as well. Uh, and I guess then the field part of it as well, so generally about a third of our year we'll spend out field uh, and that's leading and managing in the field environment. So your days typically look quite different? Yeah. Luella, how about yourself? Oh, mine's really different yep. on a daily um, basis. So as a DBO on a ship, um, it depends where the ship is. So there are days where we wake up and we're just doing all these um, drills for um, firefighting um, or firing or um, basically what it takes to take, you know, for example, the DDG, one of the ships that has the most advanced combat system um, to see. So we do that for a few hours a day. Um, there are days where I just do paperwork. Um, there are days where we actually do um, the exercises. And there are days where we work for maybe four hours, pull into port, and within an hour you're on a beach. Um, so it's, it's been great, it's been changing every day, so you really just have to be prepared for what's thrown at you, and I guess that's part of the fun of the job, right? And so you're posted to a particular ship for any yes. given period of time. Do you spend much of your time at sea versus inshore? Um, it's on a rotation basis, so expect to be at sea for anywhere between a year to two years at a time. But in between your sea postings, depending on what you've got or where you're needed, you'll probably have the same amount of time at a shore posting. So there's a lot of balance um, in that sense. And when you're on a shore posting, you're working what is equivalent equivalent to a nine to five job, except maybe you'd start at seven, and if you're lucky, you'll end at 15.30. Uh, so there's plenty of time to go to sport, um, to do PT. We normally run PT twice a day with the PTs, uh, with the PTIs, and um, get involved in, for example, for Navy, we have a lot of um, Navy sports. Um, last season, or sorry, two seasons ago, I went to the um, Navy Alpine snow sports um, camp, and we went snowboarding for a good week and I encourage everyone um, in my department to go do that when they're in shore postings because that's what it's for like there's a lot of respite um, for being ashore so we don't want our people to burn out we'd like them to you know enjoy the, their time when they're finally back on land spending that time with friends and family and doing the things they actually like aside from being obviously at sea yeah um, so Nathan has asked when did you all enter the military and did you have any drama getting in so I suppose we can talk a little bit about the recruiting process for each of you uh, and, and was science and technology an important aspect of your joining? Um, so I joined in 2016 but I went through the recruiting process in um, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I did my U session, I opened up pretty much every job that was available to me uh, which, which is pretty exciting um, and then I went for my assessment day and I applied to be an Avtech in the Army as well as in the RAF and um, I was unsuccessful the first time round. It just, um, it came down to me having no previous sort of tech skills or on tool um, experience and they asked me to be able to sort of go back. Uh, do an electronics course of some description, do a bit of work experience and really ensure that this is what I wanted to do. 
uh, as the next step. So I went away, I did an electronics course online. Um, I did some, I was really lucky to be able to do work experience with an auto electrician at work. Um, and I came back six months later and I got a job. So it's possible to go away and come back? 100%. <laughs> so we do have a lot of noise at the moment. We have a nice uh, Super Hornet coming in right now. So we recently spent some time at RAF Williamtown with Brooke, who is an aircraft technician. She works with the Joint Strike fighter jet. So let's check that out now. Sergeant Brooke Saunders, an aircraft technician in the Royal Australian Air Force. I'm posted to Williamtown in New South Wales. As an aircraft technician at Three Squadron working on the F-35s, we maintain the aircraft in both scheduled and unscheduled servicings, just make sure that they're good to go. At any given time, I can look after five to eight aircraft and maybe 20 to 30 people. You get to work with a great group of people to find solutions. As a secondary duty, I'm in charge of support section and support section for the F-35 manages all of the support equipment that we use on and around the aircraft. I used to go out on the farm with my grandfather and help him fix tractors. I knew that I was a hands-on mechanical minded person so I chose to study mathematics and physics when I was in high school as I knew that I would require that knowledge when I was carrying out my initial training to become an aircraft technician. I love being in the Air Force for the opportunities that it gives. I've literally travelled the world. I've worked with a lot of incredible people. I've played a lot of sport. I've played ADF Touch for many years and I've also played ADF Rugby. Over the 16 years working on the five different aircraft, I've had to do a systems course for each aircraft, learning everything there is to know to maintain that aircraft. The most exciting thing about working on the F-35 was when I had the opportunity to go to America and learn about the aircraft for 18 months working alongside contractors and the US Air Force. The best part about being in the Air Force and being an aircraft technician is the people. I've made best friends who I'll have for years, working in squadrons who travel together. We have a really nice family environment. My advice to any young women out there who are wanting to pursue STEM careers is to go out there and do it. Bear with us and please make sure you're sending your questions through. We will be here for the next hour. There we go. Some peace and quiet. <laughs> uh, now, right before we cut away to that footage, we were discussing the recruiting process for each of you and how we went. So, uh, Beck, we had a talk to you. We discussed uh, that you got through to your assessment day, that you had to go away and get a little bit more uh, experience, experience prior to coming back through. But uh, after six months, was it? Yep, six months I came back through and um, did my assessment a day again and was straight through. Recommended, no problem. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, science and tech, when you came through, had you studied that at school? Uh, yes, yeah, so I did science grade 10, 11 and 12. Yep. Um, I didn't actually pass it in grade 10. Okay. Uh, so I had to do like a bridging course just to ensure that I had uh, the knowledge or the base knowledge there to be able to go through and do the avionics course. Um, and then once I'd done that, straight through. No problems at all. Uh, how about yourself? Uh, so for me, I did the U session as well, so pretty similar uh, than the assessment day. I also failed my assessment day the first time that I went um, and I got uh, to return within three months to re-attempt. Um, so for the, the next time I was quite motivated because it was definitely what I wanted to do. Um, the reason I didn't get through the first time was because I didn't really have uh, enough understanding of what I was getting myself into, I guess. Okay. Um, which, it was good that they gave me that three months because mm. it did give me a bit more resilience. It did give me a lot more time to understand the job role that I was uh, applying for and wanting to go through. So I guess, uh, in DFR's respect, it's they don't really want people to come in blind. So for me, it was actually really good that they identified the fact that I wasn't really 100% sure of what I was doing yeah. uh, and then gave me another chance uh, three months later to do that again. So that was really good. Fantastic. Was it the job role that you wanted from the very beginning or was it something that you had opened on your jobs report that you, you found the interest in to come through for your assessment? Um, so I always put down civil engineering. Um, I was either going to do civil engineering through ADFA and if I wasn't successful with that I was going to do civil engineering uh, paid for by myself through uni uh, and then attempt to reapply again because I really wanted to do it in the army. Um, I did physics and chemistry at school so that sort of got me down the line of civil engineering as well as uh, doing renovations and stuff around the house at home. I really enjoyed uh, the design and building sort of thing so that's sort of what got me to civil engineering. 
And here you are, fantastic. <laughs> Luella, how was the recruiting process for you? Um, the recruiting process was probably a bit um, different for me coming from the um, Defence uh, University Scholarship. It's because um, I've, I've already done two years of university and when I first applied to them, they basically looked at my grades. So I had to trace back, um, I guess if I had to trace back, I did um, maths. I only did like two unit maths. I didn't do extension maths, but in hindsight, I probably should have done extension <laughs> maths because I had to do a bridging course. And this is just to get myself into university. So I did um, mechanical mechatronics engineering at University of Technology Sydney, which is a civilian university. Sure. Um, and um, I had to show them my HSC scores, and then I had to prove to them for the first few years that I had been in university that I was actually studying and doing quite all right before they would go, you know what, we'll pay for the rest of your degree. Um, so it was different for me in that I had to prove that I would succeed and finish my university degree first. And at that point, I was already working part-time um, at an engineering internship at um, a powertrain company. So it was an automotive company and we were designing gearboxes, which is quite different from the job that I have now, but still the same um, you know, mental processes. Um, and at that point, I realized I definitely want to be an engineer, but I definitely don't want to work in the automotive industry okay. or in an office. Yep. So I think at that point, I was like, yep, you know what, I, I'm good. <laughs> I, I think this is definitely what I want to do. And luckily enough, they were like, yeah, they, they pretty much agreed with me. I'm like, sure, we'll pay for the rest of your engineering degree and um, carried on with the rest of my military career. That's fantastic. And any other information in regards to that DUS, so the Defence um, Uni uh, sponsorship can be found on Defence Jobs. So if that's something that uh, appeals to you, definitely jump online and check that out. Uh, Lachlan asked, what is it like serving? So I guess we've talked about your day-to-day -day job roles, but how about the military aspects? So uh, what do you get to do with, say, an electronics engineer in the ADF that you wouldn't get to do in the civilian world? Um, okay. <laughs> I am so glad I don't, I don't work to meet monetary KPIs. I'm very glad that I get to work in an environment where safety and getting our people home is the most important thing. And it's not about making money, it's about making a difference and making sure my people are safe. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing that no civilian industry can give you. That's amazing. How have you guys found military as opposed to civilian? So one of my biggest motivations to join the military was because I wanted to help people, whether that was on humanitarian aid uh, type task or or just helping people on uh, things like the Army Aboriginal Community Assistance Program, which is where uh, engineers go to an Aboriginal remote location and build uh, necessities for them. Um, so doing stuff like that is what sort of really interested me uh, originally. And I forgot what the question was. <laughs> How did you find once you enlisted? Did you find you were getting those opportunities for humanitarian aid and support? Um, so at this stage, I haven't actually had the opportunity to go and do humanitarian aid. Uh, I've been part of processes to prepare for those sort of things uh, and getting soldiers ready for tasks such as that. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed that as well. Luella, you have had the opportunity. Um, yes, yeah, so we've done a deployment to the South Pacific, and um, our main mission was to um, enhance the goodwill between Australia and the South Pacific um, countries. And one of them, when we were in um, Honiara, uh, they had a village, I guess, that was affected by the flood. So my ship's company went down there, and we just volunteered to help rebuild um, their school and a couple of local, I guess, buildings like uh, they had a, a veggie patch, a local veggie patch, um, the school, a certain extensions, certain homes, basically anything that we could do to help. Um, we spent a good week just doing that and it was great. It was also a nice uh, break from work. We got to see the island um, and we got to help a lot of people. Fantastic. Beck, how have you found, I guess, you tried a few different avenues before going defence. Um, how have you found it now serving in military for a few years? Um, it's it's given a lot to my life and in different ways. Um, so I've got a young daughter and it's, it's nice to show her that you can uh, be a woman in a male dominant area and, and really su succeed in, in what we do. Um, and also it's given us the ability, you know, like um, we get subsidised housing uh, wherever we get moved to. Um, I've had the ability to go away and play sport 
uh, for three weeks. Defence has sent me away and I've played AFL uh, down in Melbourne. Um, we oh, do, wow. yeah. So away, away. <laughs> away, away, yeah, yeah. Um, we've also um, done a couple of exercises in, in Darwin and Townsville where we've had some downtime. Uh, I've never been to the Northern Territory before now, so um, we got to go to Litchfield and go to the waterfalls and uh, experience oh, wow. Darwin uh, with, at the Darwin Festival. Um, so, yeah, that was good. It's been good. Fantastic. Now, Trenton asked, how much does the physical training differ between each service? So, what does fitness look like for each of you? Uh, so, in Army, I'd say possibly is uh, the more higher uh, fitness level that you require. So, there's the basic fitness assessment that we do that's run every 12 months. So, every single person in Army is required to pass that fitness test. And it's just a baseline fitness assessment so that we know that everything we're getting uh, the guys and girls to do is... Uh, within their physical ability uh, and that reduces injury and stuff as well. Um, we also have uh, fitness assessments specific for different trades so uh, for example uh, engineers being a combat sort of role we do a high fitness assessment yep. and that includes uh, things like pack marching, carrying heavy objects, lifting objects above your head and stuff like that um, and you're required to pass those to be within the trade that you are. There is lots of training available for it uh, and we do train quite heavily for those so they're not unachievable, they're, they're definitely uh, there to be passed. And they are consistent so I guess you get your pre-entry fitness assessment prior to enlisting um, but then you do continue to monitor that fitness once you're in service. Yeah and, and we do lots of fitness uh, throughout Army as well so you progressively always get better and there's always benchmarks that you want to achieve uh, and one of the goals that everyone sets out is fitness goals every year uh, to try and keep improving on that fitness because then it makes us better soldiers and uh, able to do our job a lot better as well. Yeah, absolutely. What does fitness look like on a ship? Um, I would say not a lot of pack marching and just not a lot of places you can run to. Right. Um, but you definitely, okay, to enter you definitely have to pass a swim test. Okay. You'd have to tread water for 15 minutes and there are certain times that you have to be able to make a 500 meter swim. Um, you have to do a three meter safety jump. So if you're really into those things, they might not even be a test for you. Yeah. Um, uh, but we do have a lot of cardio and we still have that upper body. Um, standards, mostly because we do have to carry all these heavy objects throughout a ship. For example, uh, things like fire hoses, um, breathing apparatus, um, obviously your equipment um, going up and down, really small um, ladder bays. Everything's obviously really safe and really guarded and we all work together as a team, but there's a minimum fitness requirement that we obviously need um, our people to meet yeah. so that we can all go to sea safely. Of course. And Beck, how about the Air Force? Um, so we, when I was, now I've just been posted to this unit, I've been here two years now. Yep. Um, and it's all about uh, the aircraft and okay. uh, about them being served to fly. Sure. So we don't have uh, as much time internally in our work day to do PT. Mm -hmm. um, it is different for every mustering and it is different for every squadron. Yep. Um, but our workload is quite high and as uh, an avionics technician we don't, just don't have the time within the work day. There are times throughout the year where we have sporties, uh, where we have days dedicated to just having um, sport, yep. but in a day-to-day -day capability, it's just not there. Um, I do a lot outside of work uh, to maintain my fitness, and we, uh, like the other two services, have a, a 12 monthly PFT that we have to pass. Um, but again, it's, it's at a substandard. It's something you should be able to do at a basic level. It's not hard. Uh, but like when we were in IETs, we did PT three times a week. So I guess it just depends on the squadron or the unit that you're in mm. and, and what they have available for you. Fantastic. Yeah. Now we might come back to chat about this again in a moment. It looks like we have another aircraft pulling in right on time. Uh, so we actually spent some time with you today, Caitlin, uh, in your work environment. So why don't we let uh, go and have a look at that. I'm here with Caitlin. Caitlin, can you tell us where we are? Uh, so currently we're at the 6th Engineer Support Regiment located at one of the Air Force bases at Amberley and behind me is a lot of uh, plant equipment uh, and trucks that we're going to be utilised to go to Townsville uh, for the flight assist. Can you tell me a little bit about your job role as civil engineer in the Army? So as a civil engineer in the Army I get to do quite a lot of different things. Uh, currently my role is plant troop commander uh, which means I'm in charge of uh, between 120 and 130 pieces of plant equipment uh, including trucks 
trailers uh, and the plant equipment itself. Um, and I get to lead and manage uh, the people that are utilising those equipment as well as the equipment itself. Um, in addition, at the 6th Engineer Support Regiment, we have um, draftsmen, surveyors, carpenters, plumbers and electricians, which are all managed by civil engineers as well. And so what attracted you to this job role? Was this something you were always interested in in high school? So originally I wanted to be a builder. Um, I did a lot of house renovations at home with my father and I really enjoyed that. So my parents actually sent me to a private school and I thought I should probably get an engineering degree rather than uh, being a builder. So uh, that's sort of the line I went down. As well, I did um, army cadets at school. So putting army and civil engineering together, I decided to go to ADFA. Uh, from there, I studied civil engineering and um, went through all my training and now I'm at 6 years now. And what would you say are your top three favourite aspects of this job role? So I guess the first one is uh, being able to utilise my degree, being able to actually uh, come to a unit where I get to see a lot of uh, different equipment, being able to utilise that equipment and leading and managing people uh, that get to do it. I also get to do a lot of design work and stuff as well, which is awesome. Um, the second one, I guess, would be uh, leading and managing like-minded people. So a lot of the, the people that I have in my troop are plan operators mm -hmm. or there's carpenters, plumbers, like I was saying before, that I get to manage those people out on different exercises. So I actually get to use my degree, which is great. Um, and then my third one would be the amount of equipment that I get to manage. Um, being able to manage that amount of equipment is really uh, interesting. Sometimes it's quite hard, but it's, it's a challenge that is, is really enjoyable and rewarding. So uh, that's great. And being able to go and help out on humanitarian aid stuff as well is, is really uh, rewarding. So. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you for sticking with us today. Apologies for the noise. Uh, we will charge on. Please make sure you're sending your questions through. We are here for a little while longer. Now, Nicola asked, do I have to study science subjects in high school to be eligible? Uh, so for a tech side of it, um, you only need a grade 10 pass in maths, English and science, which are compulsory anyway in Queensland. Uh, so yes, but it's sort of, uh, I guess, leaving your options open because when you are in grade 10, 11, 12, you don't know what you want to do. No. Uh, when I turned 30, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I guess giving yourself all the options that you possibly can have um, and being able to pass it is what's best. Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose we have lots of uh, people coming to the Defence Force Recruiting Centre asking about what subjects they should be studying in high school and absolutely English, maths and science is a recommended subject for all of them. We will talk louder than the air. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there. Um, so, which subjects did you study in high school? Uh, so, I studied physics and chemistry okay. and as well I did extension maths. I found them all very beneficial for my civil engineering degree and generally there are prerequisite subjects for engineering degrees. Um, however, to be doing my job, I don't need to be civil engineer qualified. I can just be a non-technical engineer, uh, which means you can just go uh, through the normal process, uh, spend 18 months at the Royal Military College uh, and go into the engineering corps. Um, and you can do the same job that I, I am doing, uh, just with less technical stuff. Um, so in that respect, you don't need to have physics, uh, chemistry or maths under your belt, but it is recommended and it, w it would make the job a little bit easier, but you don't have to have it. And you found personally that it made it much easier for you? Yeah. <laughs> How about yourself, Luella? I know you went through a very different entry yeah. method, but in terms of education prior to going to uni? Okay, well, um, I guess I would suggest to, to people to work backwards from that. So if they wanted to do a particular, if, if you wanted to be an engineering officer, you'd go um, and find a particular degree that you'd like to go to and a particular university that you're um, more likely to go to. And you'd probably tailor your subjects to what they are asking you to do. I find most helpful to do at least one science subject and at least um, math. And it doesn't have to be extension math. And um, what Beck said was that keep it open. Um, any engineering or not even non-engineering degree will make use of a science subject or a math subject and it's actually quite handy to like have these um, uh, subjects later down the track for example you know what things will or will not explode in a microwave very useful also doing your taxes also very useful <laughs> find that out in math so you know picking science subjects and math subjects 
even um, in high school, has other uses aside from ending up in either a tech or engineering officer scheme. Absolutely. And I guess if we're looking at you girls both studied um, the physics and tech components in high school that you also did, though you didn't get the passes in year 10, but it is possible to go and do those bridging courses to make up those marks if you are interested in joining the ADF, perhaps yeah. a little further down the line if you didn't get those marks. Oh, 100%. And even if you decide at the end of grade 12 that you want to do it, the bridging courses are there. Um, I went into high school with a real, like I did sports and rec, and I still did science and maths and English, um, but I guess sometimes you don't get the marks you need to where you want to be, so there's always bridging courses to get you to where you, you need to be. Fantastic. Chrysel asked, is the training for the Air Force hard? Well, that's broad. <laughs> that's uh, a little broad. Um, I guess we can talk to your job roles specifically. Um, so the the rookies or the recruit process, It's a, uh, it was a 12-week process when I went through. Um, it's, it's not hard in the respect that they give you everything you need to succeed. And that sounds so cliche, even coming out of my mouth, but um, you go down there and you've, you've passed your little beep test and your push-ups and your sit-ups uh, and you've gotten your enlistment day. Yeah. And then you're, you're flown away from your family and you get down there and there are people there to train you to march, to train you to run, to train you to do push-ups uh, and to do these all in a way that you know, is going to be beneficial to your life. So it's, it's not hard. Uh, because everything is there for you to succeed. Um, the only thing that people may struggle with is, is being away from their family or um, just... It's a culture change. It's a massive Definitely. culture change. Particularly yeah. if you're going straight from school yeah. um, or, for example, if you were going from you know a couple of the civvy jobs that you had straight into yeah. military, it could be a little bit of a... Oh, it's, it's a, a culture shock for yeah. anyone at any age. Um, I went through with people that were 17 right through to people that were 46. Um, so the recruit process is, um, it's, it's there just to make you all, uh, give you all the same skills. Yep. So you all start when you go to your IETs, your initial um, employment training, with the same baseline of skills. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my IETs was 18 months, so uh, we did PT three times a week and sometimes it was hard. Um, you know, 7am in Wagga is cold in the winter. <laughs> Um, and it's also bloody hot in the summer. Yeah. So yeah, there are some things that, I mean, if you're coming from Tassie, um, 40 degrees is hot. Yep. Um, but again, all the, the things you need to get you through to the end of your recruits, to get you through to the end of your IETs, it's all given to you. Um, and there are, there, there's little struggles that we all have. We, we don't have the same maturity that other people have. We don't have the same life skills or the same knowledge. Um, but I tell you what, you're going through with um, 10 to 20 people in your IETs that are all there to do the same thing and um, you're, you're a little group. Um, you're yeah. all there to get everyone over the line. Not one person failed my IETs. Um, so, you know, it's the possibilities are there. Um, the tools are there. Yeah, and I guess you do mention that, I mean, A, they give you the skills and the training that you need. So you will come out of that with all of that training, but you are also going through the tra same training together. Oh, so, and it, you build this bond with these, uh, like I think I went through with 36 people in rookies, yep. um, from some just different, different walks of life that you would never uh, encounter in your little hometown or your big city town. Mm. Um, and it's fantastic. Uh, some of those people were just bridesmaids at my wedding. Like you just these, it's fan, you know, you, you'll never, you'll never encounter these kinds of um, situations yeah. and the people that you get to deal with them with are just lifelong friends. Uh, same with IETs, everyone's been posted to a different place, mm. um, but when I was in Townsville um, on exercise, we caught up with quite a few of the guys that I did my IETs with. Um, they're in the army, but we, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Meet once, friends for life. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. How did you find training? Uh, so for me, there was definitely quite a few times that I was like, what have I got myself into? <laughs> like, this is really hard, like how am I going to complete this task? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I got through every single thing, even if I thought I couldn't. And it's the guys and girls that are around you that help you get through and you help them with other things as well. Um, so the team cohesion is definitely like the, the thing that gets you through everything. And like Beck was saying, like everything is given to you that you need to succeed and it's up to you as the individual as to whether you want to accept that help 
whether you want to go above and beyond and help yourself to get through that, uh, those sort of things. Oh, it definitely wasn't easy all the time. Yeah. Um, I guess um, what Beck said and what Caitlin alluded to, everyone comes from different walks of life, different yeah. experiences, different shapes and sizes as well. Like, for example, I'm only five foot, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure is the minimum height <laughs> to be in the defense force. So um, I remember um, back in my, uh, I guess, initial officer training, we had a week of really hard PT sessions. It was pack marching. It was like running out, diving into the beach, and then swimming to the boy, and then coming back. And then the next day, it was like an obstacle course. And then the next day, I think, oh, so that's like day four. It was another <laughs> intense hit session. And on Friday, it was like, OK, guys, we're going to have a recovery session in the pool. We'll just walk around the shallow end of the pool, which is five foot deep. So I'm sitting there, like, treading water for a whole hour. And I'm sitting there like, yep. This is what I've gotten myself into. But the best thing about it is that we all just laugh about it and we realize that, you know, I am definitely much stronger and much fitter now than I was when I started. And everyone, everyone's exactly like that. We, we started a baseline and you only get better and better as the years go by. But that's up to you. It's how hard you push yourself. And the word hard changes from year to year. Mm. You'll have a good year one day, you'll have a bad year the next. So you'll have some days where, you know, yep, I'm definitely feeling this. Some days where you're like, nope, I'm definitely, I really don't want to run 2.4 kilometers right now. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone is out there to help each other. Mm. And you'll always get through it as a team. So even if you're struggling, no one is going to leave you alone. Everyone's going to be like, nope, we'll just work through it. Mm. And that's basically how it goes. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, Arthur asked, do you need general maths? So I suppose we've already we've discuss, uh, discussed education requirements, but how important were the subjects you chose to study in high school in helping you choose the career you wanted? So I suppose, were you aware that this is where you would be now when you were choosing your high school subjects? Um, <laughs> no. So <laughs> I, um, <laughs> Definitely not. My brother did engineering. Okay. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I was like, oh, well, I'll just do what my brother did. Yep. Um, so I looked into engineering and I pretty much just copied the subjects that he did. <laughs> uh, apart from, I did uh, PT as part of one of my subjects, mm -hmm. uh, whereas he did uh, woodwork and design. Mm -hmm. um, so that was pretty much the only difference that we had. And uh, yeah, so I didn't really know that I always wanted to be an engineer. Yep. Um, but doing those subjects, especially physics, I really enjoyed. Um, generally, I'm not that smart. I have to work really hard for um, any subject that I do. I have to study yep. quite a bit. Um, but I found physics, although really difficult for me, I really enjoyed it. And I'm a really motivated person. So I put in a lot of effort uh, out, of, out of class time as well to try and learn the physics side of things, which I guess enjoying it, then yeah. going civil engineering made me enjoy the degree that I chose to do as well. How about yourself, Luella? Um, I think so, because I did do that thing where I worked backwards, I mm. found the degree that I wanted. And look, to be honest, I did the absolute minimum high school subjects to meet <laughs> that degree, because I was like, no, I don't want to do six or six subjects. I think, yeah, depending on how it works in different states, mm. um, there's a minimum amount of points or minimum amount of subjects that you yep. need to get um, an ATAR score and I definitely went for the minimum amount of subjects there and just made sure that they were the subjects that I liked for example physics um, maths and I really liked um, software design at that time so I did that and I d enjoyed in, um, advanced English I really enjoyed books so I was like well I'm interested in that so, and it, aside from it being a requirement I was like yep I'm just gonna pick the minimum subjects that I really like and then do well in those rather than spread myself um, across more subjects hmm. so I guess it was a bit different for me in that. And I guess, Beck, we already discussed, I mean, you went through school. Oh, I look a little lackadaisical. <laughs> um, it's not, I, my parents would like cringe. They'd just be like, what are you doing? Because we all have these brains that you, but you just got to really, and you don't know what you want to do. Mm. And I um, 100% agree with Luella when she said that you've got to pick subjects that you enjoy. So yeah. I did pick subjects that would give me an OP score uh, roughly around uh, somewhere that would give me a degree that I might want to do, yep. right? Because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and But I also chose subjects that I was going to pass and yep. I was going to enjoy. So I did uh, sports and rec and I did PE. PE was a, uh, an OP board subject, so it was good. 
Um, I had a great time. There was just four subjects I really had to knuckle down on and two that I could just enjoy. <laughs> um, and that, that is probably my advice. Like, yes, do the science, do the, uh, the English and the maths, because you need them. Everywhere yeah. in your life you need them. Uh, you might not think, you, even in cake decorating you needed them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's, and they'll help you just broaden your horizons to a lot more things as well. Yeah. So, yes, they're, they're boring subjects. Nobody wants to do them, but oh, they're definitely... Physics is not boring. I'm just going to jump in there. Physics is not boring. It's a great subject. They're hard. You know, they are hard. They're, they're hard. And if you're, you're willing to, to put in the effort, then yes, they will make your life a lot easier down the track. You won't have to do as many bridging courses as I did mm -hmm. to get me where I wanted to go mm -hmm. um, effectively. So yeah, if you do them in high school, you're just setting yourself up to be able to do a lot more, a lot quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, Chad asks, is it true that one person is destined to work solely on one aircraft? Ooh, ha. Aimed at you, Beck. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to get this wrong, <laughs> but um, the new directive is that um, Leo Marshall wants us all to be cross-trained. Yep. He doesn't want us stuck on one platform because that doesn't make us uh, useful airmen. Mm -hmm. So um, the direction the Air Force is currently going in is that you'll stay on a platform uh, for two postings yep. um, and then move to another platform. Uh, that's, that's where it is at the moment. So I can't really speak to that. I've only um, been yeah, on this platform. But I work with a lot of people that have worked uh, across different platforms. You know, guys that have come up from Adelaide and been on um, the Poseidons and the Orions um, to people that have been down in Willytown, on the same platform but older. Um, so, no. No? So, no, it's not true. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I can't debunk <laughs> it. Can, uh, there's people that have been uh, 10 years at Super Hornet. So, I mean, like, it just, how motivated are you in your career to get what you want? Yep is 100% what it's going to turn out to be. If you're not motivated, then yeah, you might stay on the same platform. Uh, but there is opportunities for you to go all over the place um, and you just got to take it. Fantastic. Kerry asks, Luella, how does the officer role compare with enlisted sailors? Um, okay, what I would say would be um, enlisted sailors are more of a tech trade type and you would um, stream yourself into um, a particular um, section. So, for example, you'd be doing fire control, sensors, or um, uh, weapons, or um, guns, for example, gu guns and missiles. Um, so, for a, an enlisted sailor, you'd be doing courses that are very specific to um, the hands on maintenance that you'd be doing on a particular um, piece of equipment and that equipment would be yours and you'd be forever qualified you know um, with continuous training for that piece of equipment um, as an engineering officer though um, you would be jumping from ship to ship yep. um, if, if you were lucky or you could be stuck in one um, one type of ship but uh, you'd have to know your way across all of that equipment so you'd have to know your way across multiple sections and it's not about knowing the particular equipment down to its last bolt, which I'm sure Beck would probably know, know. Like she'd be able to tell you exactly what type of M bolt is required for what particular side of which um, you know panel. Um, for, as an engineering officer, you're more, I guess, jack of all trades in that sense, where you know how the equipment works, and you can sort of follow a train of thought and problem solve your way through it but you wouldn't have done the very specific um, maintenance courses or um, hands-on training courses to actually use maintain or operate um, that particular equipment um, that's probably the biggest difference in yep. that um, the engineering officer is a bit more generic um, the enlisted sailor is definitely um, more technical more uh, trade specific and very equipment specific. Um, the engineering officer would probably do a lot more uh, management as well and a lot more administration. So if you want to do less paperwork, definitely go for the equipment. <laughs> so that, that's probably my only advice. Um, but as an engineering officer, you also do a lot of, um, yeah, I guess, administration and a lot of um, future planning. Um, that's a bit more um, high, higher end and more strategic. Yeah. And that's what you're driven to do uh, later on in your career as you um, go up the ranks. So that's where it differs. But for both um, 
sailors and officers, you're trained to really care for your people. So as you work through the divisional system, um, as you work through the ranks, even as a sailor, even as an officer, um, you end up being uh, in charge of larger and larger groups of people. And f as a divisional officer in the Navy, you become personally invested mm. in their affairs and uh, how well they're doing, their welfare, how they're progressing. Um, and that's something that's similar to um, both officers and sailors, is that the people factor is definitely there. So, yeah. Fantastic. Amazing answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, can you tell us what some of the skills you would find are important for science and technology based roles? So you're all in a tech based role. Um, what kind of characteristics, what kind of skills have you found have benefited yourself and your peers in these job roles? Um, so I guess being able to project manage uh, is one of the skills that I need, particularly as a civil engineer. Yep. Um, so being able to look at different projects, the timeline for those projects, but as well being able to come up with solutions on the fly. So a, a, a saying that we always say in defence is the 80% 80, 80 solution made on time is better than 100% solution made too late. Okay. Um, so it doesn't always have to be the exact solution. Like There's not that much pressure to yep. make that decision because it doesn't have to be 100%. There are a lot of different ways that you can do different things. Uh, and being able to manage that uh, and leading troops as well is uh, definitely one of the main things that I guess I have to do as a troop commander. Yeah. Um, probably, um, definitely problem solving yep. and the ability to think outside the box is probably just the two things that I would say are most important, especially if you're on a seagoing ship and you're in the middle of nowhere and you come across um, problems, you might want to start thinking outside the box to get those resources that you need to effect repairs and carry on with the mission. Yeah. How about yourself, Beck? Um, I'd say adaptability. Like just being able to change with your environment. We don't always uh, fix, air, fix aircraft here on a hard stand underneath the shade. Um, sometimes we're in Darwin, out in the sun, mm. and you're roasting. Um, other times you're in Townsville underneath a, a cover. So you've just got to be able to uh, take what you've got, the knowledge you've got, and the ability to uh, <laughs> do all types of things and um, be able to, you know, put that out in any, any environment. Yeah. Fantastic. So another uh, method of entry for those interested in a science or technology based role is marine technician in the Navy. Now we recently spent some time with Kerry who took us through what her job entails. So let's have a look at that. I'm Kerry Bickman. I'm a leading seaman marine technician submariner and I'm currently at Fleet Support Unit West. My role as a marine technician in submarines is to maintain the machinery and the propulsion system. On a day-to-day -day basis, I conduct preventative maintenance on different parts of machinery to ensure that they're in a good working order. We also conduct corrective maintenance, which is any defects throughout the boat that needs to be fixed. And by maintaining it to a good standard, it allows the submarine to go to sea. So the skill set that's needed to do my role as a marine technician is to have a logical mind and a bit of common sense so that you can see how things work, how you can pull it apart, put it back together. And that's also taught to you through Navy training continuum. I enjoy being in the Navy because of the variety that it provides, the friendships that are made, and also not just working for myself, but working for the people of Australia as well. I think it's good for young women to study science, maths, engineering. I know I studied maths at school and that helped me with my trade as a fitter. It's also really helped me to do the electrical work that I've needed to learn. My advice to young women that would like to pursue a career as a submariner or marine technician is just to go for it. There's no difference between you or anybody else. Everyone's afforded the same opportunities and if that's what you really want to do, then do it. Thank you for hanging out with us for the last hour for this Q&A. We do have a few more questions to go so we will get through those before we wrap up for the evening. Now, uh, Nikki asked, can people with entry level qualifications gain entry to the ADF or would industry experience always be a choice? Uh, so I think I, un I understand this question. Okay. So um, I had no experience in okay. avionics uh, before I joined and the ADF gave me all of my 
my skills and my uh, experience and all the rest of it. Um, so um, no, you don't need it. Uh, it you, if you join a role, like a tech role like mine, they will give you all the uh, training and uh, on the job training that you need to be able to successfully be an avionics tech. Um, I don't know if they mean if you've already got a uni degree, Okay. Uh, maybe that that side of it where you've you've come in with half a degree and um, d definitely not. I don't think um, industry experience is um, necessary for that because what Beck said is that we provide or ADF provides that training mm -hmm. for your particular role and in fact they provide that training and then some and it's you're always training you're always in, in a training loop because as soon as you get good and qualified for your job you're you're working to be promoted you're working to be um, cr being cross-trained for a different platform a different aircraft so uh, for me I, I don't think they would prefer industry experience in fact it's actually easier to teach and train someone with from those, scratch yeah. with um, <laughs> the basic principles so Definitely not. I don't think industry experience is preferred in this okay. sense. Fantastic. Now, Keely has asked uh, to Caitlin, as a civil engineer in the Army, is your role more focused on project management activities or actual design and calculation work? So, for example, roads and infrastructure. Um, so, I guess it has a lot of all of those different things. Yep. So, project management uh, generally, as I progress in my career, will become more prominent in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, however, at the moment, it's more design work and calculations. Um, so, generally, my officer commanding, who's pretty much my boss, he's the one that does the project management along with his team of work supervisors uh, and uh, construction engineers that he has in his team. Um, and they do a lot of the project management um, and they actually do a fair bit of the design stuff as well. Um, but for me personally, I'll go out and look at a site, uh, conduct a reconnaissance with my offsider, which is my sergeant, uh, and as well as some experts from my troop. Um, and from there, I'll come up with a plan of what I think the best solution is, come up with a design uh, as well for that. So I guess depending on where you are in your career and your career yep. progression, you'll get to touch on all of those things. Wonderful. Joel asked, what are the major differences between an aircraft technician and an avionics technician? Um, how dirty your hands get. <laughs> so, um, so, as an avionics technician, we still get to change generators and, and get some of those funky things on our hands. Mm -hmm. But generally, the black handers do all the engines, um, the hydraulics, all that kind of stuff, and we're more uh, electronics based. So, obviously, screens. Um, right lots of lo massive difference and it, it if you want to be a mechanic on an aircraft yep. you want to be an ATEC. Um, if you want to be this is really basic if you want to be an auto alecky on a plane then you want to be an AvTech. Okay. So I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Matt asked are the skills and qualifications you earn in your training transferable if you decide to leave defence? Yep, definitely for me, like civil engineering degree, it's done through the University of New South Wales, uh, but just at the ADFA campus, so I have a, a degree that I can utilise outside of defence as well as inside of defence. Um, as well, I'm wanting to start my master's next year, which is also paid for by defence, um, and I'll do that in project management. So. I'll have a civil engineering degree and a project management uh, degree as well, and both of those I can utilise outside of defence as well. Perfect. Um, in addition to what Caitlin um, said, uh, there are a lot of skills that you get that um, are applicable and they might not necessarily be written down on paper. Yep. So um, with the STEM side of it, you d do tend, especially in our roles as technicians and engineers, you do tend to pick up a lot of um, science and technology, just the way that you understand equipment mm -hmm. and the way that you're exposed to all this like high tech equipment and this cutting edge technology, you learn a lot more just by being here that you can take outside and tell people that yes, I've worked on different types of equipment and you've got the teamwork, the leadership, the ability to manage people, the ability to talk to people um, of higher ranks and the ability to talk to your peers and to be able to explain technical things to them is a very transferable skill and in fact a lot of employers would like that um, in people even if you go to a non-technical civilian role, the ability to communicate really hard technical problems, which I'm sure um, Beck will tell you about. Um, 
Yeah, so that's definitely a transferable skill. And those are things that don't just come written down in paper. And I'm sure a lot of people leave um, the forces with glowing recommendation letters telling them that they've been able to do all of these things. Um, yeah, so there's a lot. There's a lot Absolutely. more to Absolutely. Throughout my um, degree, I did my work experience with a civilian company, and they actually offered me a job at the end because my ability to lead uh, and be motivated to find different jobs around uh, and being able to manage different meetings uh, and just the way that I communicated with them, they were really happy with that. So they actually look for people that are in defence because they want those specific skills, not just a civil engineering degree, but being able to lead, being able to manage and communicate are all very important skills that we definitely pick up along the way in defence. Um, and the defence aviation side of it has just moved across onto uh, um, to a DAZA which will give you a license so depending on what your field is and obviously there's no super hornets out in the city street so my qualifications are uh, a little <laughs> very specific <laughs> yeah very specific but um, obviously we have civilian frames in uh, defense so your qualifications do go across the more you have depends on the airframe you work on effectively awesome now final question what has been the highlight of your career so far I know some of us are um, fresher than others in that okay. career, but... <laughs> uh, professionally, being able to take one of our most advanced um, combat system equipped ships to the States and being able to fire missiles and do all these really charry, really amazing um, drills and exercises with the US Navy was fantastic because in between doing all these exercises and firing missiles, I got to you know spend Thanksgiving in a hired green combi van and drive up to Big Bear Lake and go camping for three days. And that was in the middle of that. And prior to that, we went to Hawaii. And then after that, on the way home, we went by Tahiti. So that was an absolute absolute blast, pun not intended, um, <laughs> for that time. And I think I'm always going to remember that. And I made the best friends throughout, through that trip as well. So definitely a highlight for me. So for me, I've, most of my time in defence has been training. So mm -hmm. I actually finished my training uh, end of September last year. So I haven't actually had the opportunity to do cool things like that. Um, <laughs> but <come>. yeah, <laughs> there, there's definitely opportunities out there in Army. Uh, and I know a heap of my mates have done really cool things. So I'm really looking forward to it. Fantastic. Beck? Um, look, I've got to travel. Like I went into Northern Territory last year, uh, back up to Townsville. And uh, I've been away, you know, with, with RAF footy. So it's, it's all been a highlight so far. Yeah. I'm, I'm so fresh, so it sounds so green, but yeah, it's. All of it's been good so far. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sitting with me today, guys. Thank you for sending through all of your questions. We hope we were able to answer them and show you the wide range of roles available within science and technology in the ADF. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll be sure to answer them in the comments section below over the next few days. So keep an eye out on that. We'll see you next time.